Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. A few days ago, I saw an interesting movie on Netflix, of course, The Greatest Night in Pop, uh, about a, a January night in 1985 when some of the the greatest musicians of that age, including Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, got together to sing a song, uh, We Are the World, in direct response to back then in 1985, the famine in Ethiopia, of course, sparked by some of the work Bob Geldorf was doing in the UK uh, for musicians to support suffering around the world. 50 years, though, of course, before 1985, in the mid-1930s, uh, United States was in the midst of the Great Depression. And rather than Ethiopia, the human suffering was next door, particularly in the American countryside, uh, the Great Depression hit the farming communities of the Midwest with particular violence. Many farmers lost their homes, huge amount of suffering, starvation. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, there's a new book out about music uh, as a way of, uh, I don't know quite know how to put it, a music to address that great crisis in humanity in the mid-1930s. Uh, the book is called A Chance to Harmonize, How FDR's Hidden Music Unit Sought to Save America from the Great Depression, One Song at a Time. It's written by uh, Berkeley's, um, a Berkeley-based musicologist, Cheryl Kaskowitz, uh, who is joining us from Berkeley now. She lives just up the road from where I used to live in Berkeley. Cheryl, can one compare the the terrible violence of the famine in Ethiopia in 1985 w with what was happening in America in the 1930s, do you think? It's so fascinating that you brought in that lens because I hadn't made that connection before. Uh, but certainly, if you think about, yeah, the level of suffering, um, you know, it, it's hard to compare suffering and trauma. Uh, but there was, I think that it's hard for people to remember the, or to understand since most of us don't remember the level of suffering that was wrought by the great depression. People lost their homes, you know, lost their jobs. Um, some people had to leave the land where they were because um, of dust storms, things like that, you know? So, so I actually think it's a, it's a really interesting uh, way in to think about it. Yeah, and I, I, it's rather crass to compare human tragedy and suffering. I, I don't mean to suggest that we can quantify them, but similar, similar kinds of catastrophes and similar ways in which music was used to address that. Of course, when it came to The Greatest Night in Pop, uh, The We Are the World, it was, uh, it was premised on the the making of a single which was then sold and the money was used to support relief efforts in Ethiopia. What you write about, though, in A Chance to Harmonize is rather different. Song or, or the role of local song is more central. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. The, the music itself was used to help build community, boost morale, give people hope um, and, you know, pride in their in themselves and in their communities um so in that way it was a bit it was more direct right uh it wasn't fundraising uh and it was being done by the the u.s government by the new deal so why don't you you get into it of course uh, we've done many shows on fdr and the new deal why was what you're describing in a chance to harmonize um uh, the, the Hidden New Deal program that used folk music to try to change America. Why, why is it so symbolic of, 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 of FDR and the New Deal? Oh, 
That's a great question. What I often find is that people equate the WPA with the New Deal. Uh, so, and that was a focus on jobs and getting people back to work. And that was very important. Um, this came out of an effort to offer relief. Um, so it came out of the resettlement administration, which was, uh, brief. It lasted two years. Then it became part of the farm security administration. Uh, it was renamed. And part of that was because what it, it was probably one of the more radical, uh, agencies and initiatives of the new new deal in terms of an attempt to remake american ideology i would say um and that is actually made very explicit um in the reports about what the music unit and specific specifically was doing to try to build community on these government homesteads that were built by the resettlement administration um, in rural areas. They were meant for people, they were called uh, stranded populations. And so uh, th that was farmers whose land had failed, um, literally could not farm anymore. The government would um, buy that back uh, and turn it back into uh, into forest or uh, you know a, a park situation. Uh, then you have miners and uh, other industrial workers where the mill had closed, the mine had closed. There was no other way to make a living where they were, uh, and urban unemployed who were in a way stranded in the cities where they lived because there was no opportunities for work. And so it was this idea of getting people off of relief or the dole uh, and in this very dramatic way, and that was framed at the time as an experiment, building new homestead communities in these rural areas, having people come in and create something from scratch. And the idea was that it was a, it was supposed to be based on the idea of cooperation. And uh, it was run by uh, someone who's been a bit lost to history with a fantastic name, uh, Rexford Guy Tugwell. Yeah. And he was a very uh, good looking fellow, wasn't he? At least. Yes. Uh, yes. And he looked like a movie star, but uh, right, that's exactly what I thought when I saw that picture. And uh, the press, he was uh, uh, well, an economics uh, professor at Columbia who somehow got plucked out of <laughs> academia to run the resettlement administration by FDR. Yes, yes. So he was part of the Brain Trust, um, who FDR assembled uh, as advisors. So, yeah, an economics professor. Um, very progressive in his views. He called himself, you know, a collectivist or a communalist. Uh, he, he believed that cooperation, cooperative farming, cooperative industries um, was kind of the solution um, to getting out of the Great Depression. And yes, as you can imagine, uh, he was became basically the whipping boy for the progressive flank of the New Deal. Yeah, I'm guessing uh, conservatives, uh, oh. Cheryl, if 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 they have the audacity to watch my show, will be thinking, oh, my God, this is Stalinism my or certainly yes. Soviet oh, yes. style, was, yes, Soviet he was style progressivism in, in America, the idea of resettlement, new communities. Um, oh, was there that element you. to it in, in a good or even perhaps a bad way? Oh, he was called Rex the Red. Anything he did, uh, he actually, the first thing that he tried to do was put forward the, the food and drug bill because right. before this time, there hadn't really been regulations around what people could say about food and drugs when they were advertised. Um, and he, 
nobody else wanted to touch it um, because it was so there was so much opposition, you know, from. And this was Rex Red running the a lot of ours here, uh, the resettlement administration. He ran it. Um, and That's right. uh, so how I, big was this administration? How much money and resource did, did F, FDR give it? Oh, it was huge. I think it was 46. I I often confuse million and billion at this point because but, I hope <laughs> um, it would be but huge for its time. It had, you know, over 10,000 employees. Um and what it was was a reorganization of a lot of different kinds of initiatives and it was named after uh the resettlement division uh there were two there was actually a suburban and and a rural um resettlement uh my focus is on the on rural uh people have should know about suburban because that's where uh like greenbelt maryland came from just as an aside um so so yes yeah, so rex the red as they called him uh was given control to try this experiment what happens if we set up these communities in these rural areas uh you know and provide uh for people you know it, it also came out of eleanor roosevelt was very much involved in these um in these homesteads surprise surprise uh Cheryl. <laughs> right yeah um and now, FDR did, also. did FDR approve of Eleanor's uh involvement or I guess he couldn't control everything she did and and was her network her friends were they all involved in this too I mean you know it it's usually just spoken of as sort of her you know pet project um and uh, FDR, it depends on uh, different stories tell it differently, but he was part, he believed in this back to the land movement, this idea about that, um, you know, industrialization had brought people too far away from the land. Um, and so he definitely supported it. Um, and, you know, if you go back a little bit farther, it comes out of the um the settlement house movement um i don't think that that is a an accident that they have such similar names um they and that was you know a it was a focus on helping the urban poor um and i think that that the the idea of helping people <laughs> you know was was a lot of the core of of what they cared about and well, to, um, to what extent was the resettlement administration a kind of a legacy of the progressive populism of, of men like william jennings bryan well i guess i don't see it as connected in that way as i do to you know a, a, a focus more on uh community and this idea that the settlement house uh movement would have these houses where people would come and live um you know the people like they they offered recreation they offered um you know classes um to help uh, mostly the immigrant poor in the cities and so that was more like in the 19 you know during the progressive era is when it started. So who who um, who, who is most the same? You you might remind us because you know a lot more about it than than I do, and certainly our audience. Who who was behind the settlement initiative, the settlement communities themselves? Yeah, well, that has a, a whole other history. It actually started uh, in in the UK, um, and uh, and then it was brought to the states. It was uh, very much. Uh, woman focused here in the states so um francis perkins was involved a lot of new dealers actually came out of the settlement house movement um and uh so hull house in chicago um henry street in new york uh eleanor roosevelt volunteered at rivington um 
settlement house in in the on the Lower East Side, and uh, some of her biographies point to that as um, when FDR went and visited her there. He so let's um, let's get to the core of your book, um, <laughs> uh, uh, Cheryl. A chance to harmonize. It's not about the resettlement administration. It's about the role or the way in which they they sought to integrate music into these resettlements tell us what the thinking was behind that and the role and centrality of of this very ambitious very radical idea associated with with folk music absolutely well the it came because at the beginning the homesteads there was a lot of discord on them there was a lot of the morale was very low people had been suffering and here they were in this new community um you know a lot of times it was being built around them uh their houses weren't ready um uh, and so it was actually a conscious decision to send in music leaders to help with that morale because it was seen as and not just you know as recreation, it was really seen as core to the whole enterprise that um, they needed to form this sense of community. And they felt that it, it actually came from the homestead directors. They said, we need music leaders. Um, one of my favorite quotes from a report at the time was, you know, that we need to send in music leaders to help with this emergency situation, which I love <laughs> that idea. So, so the music um, was, it was a practical thing where people were, were singing together or, 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 yeah. or musicians were brought in to uh, give musical education to these people who were being resettled. Yeah, well, it, it started out as pretty open in terms of what it could be their idea the idea was get adults making music together that's going to help build the sense of community um they also offered children's lessons which was what a lot of people you know kind of expected from that sort of thing and what happened um was that as the director of this music unit they hired charles seeger who is Pete Seeger's father. Um, and he was the one who identified folk music as the music that would serve the best vehicle. Um, you know, the idea was here is music that that is being, what is the social use of music? And he felt like folk music, music that connected to people's communities, that people, you know, that that people really um it meant something to them would then add to the idea that creating any kind of music together would help um build community we are talking with cheryl kaskowitz the author of a chance to harmonize very interesting new book about how FDR's hidden music unit sought to save America from the Great Depression one song at a time. We're going to take a short break. Remind everyone that the show is brought to you by Liberties, a quarterly journal of culture and politics. We're going to run a short feature on Liberties. And then we'll be back with Cheryl Kaskowitz to talk more about this music unit and uh, the history of folk music in, in 20th century America. So don't go away, anyone. We'll be back in a second news, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties is not just a journal of ideas, it's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can subscribe to Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We're speaking with Cheryl Kaskowitz, the author of A Chance to Harmonize, a very interesting new book about uh, one of the more radical music initiatives in FDR's uh, New Deal. Uh, Cheryl, what about, you, you, you mentioned um, uh, Charles Seeger, the father of Pete Seeger, who was often seen as the father of American 
folk music. What was the state of American folk music in the 1930s? Hmm. Well, it's a really interesting question. Charles Seeger was just coming around to it. Um, it, it hadn't really bit spread in the way that uh, it, it would later with the folk revival. Uh, and that's why I see the story of the music unit as this kind of prequel to the story that's usually told about where the folk revival came from. Um, and so, I mean, Al, it usually starts with Alan Lomax and Pete Seeger, who are both basically teenagers at this time. Uh, and so um, you had uh, a... a burgeoning interest. Um, people talk about the 1930s as a time when uh, there was a lot of pride building in folk, um, in documenting American culture. Um, and so uh, John Lomax, Alan Lomax's father, uh, had been doing this kind of public um, folklore of collecting uh, for several years at this point. Um, but it was in 1934 that the first national folk festival was held uh, by the government. Uh, and uh, and it was growing. Uh, the interest in it was growing, but it, it hadn't quite, uh, it, it was just the beginning. Charles Seeger had originally he came from a, a classically trained musical background. He was an avant-garde composer. Um, and so earlier uh, he had he had sort of been pretty dismissive about folk music. and he he started to understand it as um, Molly Jackson, who was an activist uh, union activist, came to New York. And uh, it was this time of discovery for him and for, I think, a lot of people in the urban music world. Sure, I mentioned uh, having seen The Greatest Night in Pop, uh, which featured many great African-American artists, Diana Ross, uh, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, many others. Was the folk beginnings of this folk revival or however you want to describe it that was triggered or invested in by the resettlement administration was it a very white thing i mean was folk music at that point i mean african americans of course had their own very rich musical traditions but was what you're writing about in a chance to harmonize is this white folk music well it's an important question because what it does is illuminate some of the racism that was built into the New Deal, uh, no matter what they tried, really. Uh, so these homesteads were segregated and the music unit focused their work on the white homesteads. Um, so there is this theme that runs through the book in terms of who is included. Um, and the folk music that they were really focusing on was the what has become, you know, most well known, like Appalachian. Um, it was called hillbilly music, uh, bluegrass. So it did. It was along this color line, um, and what I try to show in the book is that it's very difficult to contain music within that kind of a cover of a color line. Um, and also that, you know, it's something that we need to grapple with in terms of the history and the legacy of the new deal. Yeah. Um, so obviously this was initiated by people like Rex for Tugwell, Rex, the red leftist progressives, and yet, as you suggest, they fell in. They fell into the old racial and racist stereotypes and problems. What did African American 
people, leaders, what did they think of this? And, and were they angry that they were excluded and their musical traditions were excluded? Well, I'll just say that people didn't really know about it at the time. There was a lot of, you know, anger and activism around segregation starting around this time. Um, and I will say that people, the Roosevelt's and Tugwell, you know, they considered themselves um, to be, you know, pretty progressive in their in their racial views. What people point, what historians point to, is the fact that the control of all these homesteads was given over to the local offices, either state or even more local. Um, and when you're talking about the South. Um, during this time period, it was ruled by Jim Crow segregation. So, um, yeah, I, I think that it is uh, what I can say in the book is that one of the collectors, um, whose name was Sidney Robertson, um, did do some of the, she collected folk music and I can talk more about that, but part of what she did was to kind of break free, get off of the homesteads and go and capture some of the music that was happening in other communities um, that weren't included. Cheryl, in it's a fascinating story, but is it a, is, is your story, is this a, a narrative, a kind of historical curiosity? Did anything really come out of the, you said that the resettlement administration and Rex, the Reds involvement was relatively short lived. What are the concrete legacies of the story in, 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 in musical and in political terms, uh, the story you tell? Well, I think it's really interesting. Yes, the resettlement administration was started in 1935 it was folded into the Department of Agriculture in 1937, became the Farm Security Administration. And a lot of these kinds of things, while they continued, were, um, you know, curtailed a bit. I think that musically, what we have are the recordings. And so Sydney and some of the other music unit staffers went out and recorded folk music and they weren't recording from musicians necessarily. It, they were interested in music being used. And so it is this amazing archive of the the soundtrack. Uh, I think of it as sort of a, a, a sonic counterpoint, counterpart to the FSA photographs that have become so famous, like Dorothea Lang. Yeah, the Dorothea Lang. If for people watching, we we have her famous image of migrant mother. Um, and and of course, you you write about this. A lot of these recordings are now what in the in the Library of Congress. Yeah, they're at the Library of Congress, um, in the American Folklife Center, and they just. The way I felt when I was writing this book, and it happened to me so often, is that I felt like I could go off and tell a deep story about so many of the things that I came across. You know, the musicians, um, there was, she, there were union activists. She had a real interest in understanding how labor union activists used music. So she went and very uh, confidentially recorded that music, which is which you could we can now listen to. And I did put up a selection of the recordings on my website um, so that if people want to listen along while they read, uh, they're available there. Um, but otherwise, it, they can be difficult to come by. Um, I will say, though, that they did, a lot of them did seed the folk revival. Um, these recordings were available to Pete Seeger, to, you know, Mike and Peggy Seeger, uh, who went on and recorded many of them. Um, Woody Guthrie, did he 
how, how was he connected with this? Yeah, so the the um, the book that Seeger and Woody Guthrie put out, uh, what is it? Uh, so hard hitting songs for hard hit people, uh, which was a lot of protest songs. Um, they took a big chunk of those songs from the music unit, um, either from the recordings. Um, another thing that Charles Seeger did was put together song sheets to be distributed at the homesteads. And so that was a, a form that they seemed to just, they basically reprinted it in that book. Then that book then becomes the version of the song that people know. And so if you go back and look, you can see the fingerprints of um, this music unit all over the folk revival. What about the, the politics of it? You, you noted that in 36 or 37, the resettlement administration was folded into the, the Department of Agriculture, which was headed, of course, by Henry Lewis, uh, Wallace at one point, at this point, who was perhaps the most progressive of all figures involved in the New Deal associated with FDR. Um, was, did you talked about changing or remaking American ideology. Did this experiment have any impact on how people thought about being American? I thought about that so often when I was writing this book, especially, you know, during the COVID shutdown and all of these questions about like public good versus individual rights. I, I, it would be difficult to argue that it made an ideological difference. I will say that in general, uh, histories of the resettlement administration sort of paint it as a failure. It didn't work. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. When you dig into some of the homesteads, you'll find people who say, you know, that their families talked about what a lifesaver it was. Um, Johnny Cash actually was one. Um, wow. So family. Johnny Cash, did he grow up in a resettlement administration or was he too young? No, he was, he was like young. He was around five uh, when they moved there in Arkansas to um, Dias Colony. Um, and he talks openly about how his parents said that it saved them. That one was specifically for farmers um, whose lands had failed. And uh, yeah, he was a little too young to be recorded um, by the music unit, but I, I love the fact that there's that connection. Yeah, we wouldn't perhaps have Johnny Cash or his remarkable family had it not been for this initiative. Um, the movie I talked about, uh, Greatest Night in Pop, features a very awkward Bob Dylan uh, who looks very embarrassed around Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson and Diana Ross. Of course, Dylan is very famous on lots of fronts, but particularly for his challenge to traditional folk in 1965 uh, at, uh, at the Newport uh, folk festival when he went electric how did this history that you cover in a chance to harmonize how did it affect the history of, of of folk music in the in the post second world war age as folk became more and more central particularly to progressives that's a huge question um i think that it was one of the foundations that that folk revival was being built on. Um, it, as I said, w one of the origin stories is Pete Seeger being taken to the Asheville Folk uh, Festival and where he first learned the uh, first heard, no, first learned the five string banjo uh, he that's where he got his first banjo. And uh, the reason he was there is because Charles Seeger had a field had a a work trip there uh, and brought him along. And so I think that it is 
it is just so that's on one level there's the recordings that fed in and it's hard with folk when you're talking about folk and you know folk culture it's hard to trace um where things actually start but i think that you can look at these these foundational things that the music unit laid um the recordings the the fact that charles seeger would brought Pete Seeger into proximity of these musicians because of the work that he was doing with the resettlement administration. Finally, uh, Cheryl, as America or Americans, particularly progressives, try to rethink their, their platforms, their, their way of reorganizing society, can we learn anything from this about the challenges of the 2020s i mean obviously the suffering of, of some americans is it can't be compared to what happened in the 1930s but um there are a lot of people suffering in america today hunger unemployment C can we learn anything and and in in telling this story and researching it do you think there may be an opportunity for a second chance uh, another way of resettling america or of remaking American ideology in the 2020s, using perhaps modern technology, different ways of doing things? It's something I've thought about a lot. I saw that the Surgeon General declared a uh, an epidemic of loneliness and social um, disconnection. Um, yeah. No, no social media. I think he saw it as being caused in part by this, what he, I think he thinks as a, uh, an illness of social media, a pandemic of social media. Right, right, right. And that people have lost, you know, actual in-person social connections. I mean, it, I think about sometimes about the book Bowling Alone, uh, mm. written in 95, I think. You Putnam's know, it's like book, and he's been on the show too. And we were actually talking about the, his book and his thinking earlier this week. Yeah. I mean, the fact that is, is you know, not just not bowling alone anymore. You know, the, our bowling alleys have closed. <laughs> we, you know, um, it's, so I do wonder about if you look at that Surgeon General's initiatives to combat, um, you know, and create social connection. I sometimes wonder you know, uh, wow, is there a role for music in there? Uh, you know, and, and, and I think that idea about uh, digital connections, uh, you know, needs to be further explored is it, do those do they count in some way also?